Good afternoon, everyone. I am joined by the woman who needs no introduction to my right, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persa Kelly. To her right, another guy who is familiar to so many of you from the Department of Health's Communicable Disease Service, its medical director, Dr. Ed Lifshitz, Judy and Ed, as always. To my far left, State Police Superintendent Colonel Pat Callahan, Pat Callahan. Uh, Murphy should be able to pronounce Callahan. Uh, again, needs no introduction. And a real treat joining us today to my immediate left is our senior United States Senator Bob Menendez. Senator, honored to have you here. Uh, director of the Department of Homeland Security, where are you? Uh, and preparedness, uh, Jared Maples is also with us. Um, and Matt Placken, our, our general counsel, will join us shortly. Senator Menendez is here to give an update on the standing of current efforts in Washington to further relief to the American people and additionally and specifically to states. It is the second aspect, direct aid to states, that is the most pressing of issues and it is increasingly one that knows no political party. In fact, it is an issue that is uniting both Democrats and Republicans. Senator Menendez, it must be noted, in addition to many other things we could say about him, uh, is the sponsor, as you can see with his Republican colleague, Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, of legislation that would deliver $500 billion to state and local governments across the nation, states and communities, I might add, red and blue alike, to ensure the delivery and maintenance of essential services that our people rely upon. We're talking about police fire and EMS services. We're talking about frontline public health workers. We're talking about educators. We're talking about local public works and sanitation, about the men and women of the Department of Labor who are working through hundreds of thousands of unemployment applications to deliver every penny to the residents who need it most, and that's just a few examples. On the other side of the Capitol, in the House of Representatives, we're seeing similar bipartisan efforts. I had a conference call last week with a group of House members from New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut, led by our very own Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill and New Jersey Republican, another friend, Peter King, uh, a New York Republican, rather, Peter King, who have formed a regional COVID-19 task force to work together to deliver more assistance for our states. And I continue my efforts along with my Republican colleagues, and including and especially Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland, who serves as the chairman of the National Governors Association to press the case for state assistance even further. In fact, I just got off a, a video call with the White House, uh, Vice President Mike Pence and his team, along with Governor Hogan, and we each made this plea explicitly on that call. I'm proud to have been among the first governors to sound the alarm for the need for direct federal assistance. I led the first letter to our national leaders with three of my colleagues when no one else saw this coming storm. I co-authored an op-ed for the New York Times with my Republican colleague and high school classmate Charlie Baker of Massachusetts back on March 27. And 11 days ago, I had the opportunity to directly press our case to President Trump when I had the honor of joining him and his team at the White House. I spoke to the Vice President uh, on Saturday uh, privately uh, about a number of things, including money. I spoke with Speaker Pelosi as well on Saturday at length about uh, the House uh, efforts in this respect. And all throughout, the guy to my left, we have had Senator Menendez in the ring with us. He was one of the first to climb in, and he's been with us for every step of this fight, unlike anyone else I know. Unfortunately, there are those in Washington, like Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, to pick a name, who don't seem to get it. These are leaders from states that are all too happy to spend the tax dollars of New Jerseyans on pork projects back home, but seemingly have no interest in helping states like New Jersey at this moment to avert a national economic catastrophe. We've said it before, but it bears repeating. Kentucky gets back $2.41 cents for every dollar it gets from taxpayers, including ours. Senator McConnell, good luck tapping New Jersey for your next project in Kentucky if New Jersey has nothing to give because you refuse to help us restart and recover. These are the minds that Senator Menendez has been working hard to change. Others in a different yet similar vein suggest it's the fault of the states that COVID-19 has ravaged us. Forget the fact that we have lost now more than 9,300 
of our blessed New Jerseyans to this illness. Forget the fact that we have had to shutter our economy to try to save lives. No, forget that. To them, all they see is what past administrations had piled up. Some have even suggested that our states should just go bankrupt. It's an echo of that classic newspaper headline from the 1970s, except the message today is Washington to states, drop dead. No one has asked for a bailout, and no one will. What we are asking for is the ability to prevent the public health emergency we are trying desperately to climb out from into a second Great Depression. We're asking for help to keep first responders, frontline workers, and educators from having to fear for their jobs. Nor might I proud, proudly add, is, the state, is this state the state that it once was not that long ago? We've run up back-to-back -back record surpluses. We've made historically unprecedented pension payments while also having consecutive years of lower expenses for public employee health benefits. We've made the first payment into the state's rainy day fund in a decade. If there is an administration tackling New Jersey's legacy fiscal issues, it's this one. And yet all some in Washington can hear are the noises from our past. To put it in Sunday school terms, they're all the happier to lay the sins of those who created this mess at the feet of those trying to fix it. And a f fiscal disaster is not months away. Hard and unpalatable decisions are being made in the here and now. They'll be on our doorstep in just a few weeks. Several cities are currently, as we speak, currently preparing for layoffs. And it's not just here in New Jersey. I promise you these discussions are happening in red states and blue states across the nation. Senator Menendez knows, just as some of his Republican colleagues know, we need significant federal investments in our states to allow for our recovery. Without it, there will likely be no recovery. And time is of the essence. And Congress needs to act and act now. And I thank Senator Menendez for his tenacity in making our case and bringing along his reasonable Republican colleagues. This fight is not over, and I know I will do everything I can to see that it is won. I know that Senator Menendez will do everything he can to see that it is won. Just because the senator has an, a heart out and has, has to get down to Washington, uh, back to the business of p moving this ball along toward the end zone, I'm going to stop uh, in my remarks, take a break, and ask uh, if I could ask Senator Menendez uh, to, to speak with us again. There is no better fighter. Forget just the folks who fight for New Jersey. There's no better fighter right now for the working class folks and families out there in this country than Senator Bob Menendez. Senator? Well, uh, thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm glad to be here today and join the Governor and Commissioner Purchaselli and Superintendent Callahan. And I want to thank Governor Murphy for his leadership. He has had to make some incredibly difficult choices, but the, the decisions that he has made has saved lives. And that's what's most important, the health and safety of every New Jerseyan. In fact, Governor Murphy was ahead of the curve, and I applaud him and his team for taking early action to slow the spread of the virus. And by the way, lest we forget, doing all of this while recovering from his own health challenges. And it's good to see that you're looking well, Governor. That leadership has never mattered more. Now, as the Governor said, unfortunately, I may have to leave early to head back down to Washington for votes this afternoon. I wish I could say it is to move legislation to address this public health and economic crisis, but it is not. The vote is to approve another Trump nominee, not to deal with America's most pressing needs, which is COVID-19. That said, I've already begun in earnest working with my colleagues in Washington on a COVID-4 stimulus package that includes robust, flexible funding for states and communities on the front lines. Because despite all the great work that the governor is doing to combat COVID-19, New Jersey can't do it alone. A national emergency requires a national response. We New Jerseyans did not choose for nearly 140,000 of our friends, family members, and neighbors to contract the virus. We did not choose to lose more than 9,000 of our loved ones to COVID-19. We did not choose to have our economy decimated and our state and local governments besieged 
by the soaring costs of responding to the virus at a time when tax revenues have all but dried up. Our doctors, nurses, and other frontline medical professionals are working to the bone at great risk to their own personal health and safety to keep people alive and to contain the virus. And I'm proud to see, Governor, uh, after a lot of lobbying based upon what I saw was the first round as unfair to our state, last week our hospitals received $1.7 billion uh, that I think was critical to their existence. Our unsung heroes, grocery clerks, warehouse staff, transit workers, and others are keeping our food and supp supply chains going and making sure that all essential employees can get to work. Our economy has been shaken, businesses are struggling, millions have been furloughed or laid off. People are suffering and the state and nation is hurting. Now I've been through a lot of difficult life-changing events in my time in Congress. September 11th, the 2008 financial collapse, Superstorm Sandy, but nothing, nothing like this. And while this is different, we New Jerseyans are tough and resilient. We don't back down from any fight, and whatever knocks us down only makes us stronger. So look, I yearn as much as the next guy for the day when all this is past us and we can finally return things to normal or a new normal. I'd like to get a haircut, and my fiance would love to go to the hairdresser. But the fastest way to jumpstart our economy and get back to normal is through testing. That's why we need a national strategy for widespread testing so that everyone who needs a test can get a test, something promised by the administration but not yet, the national administration but not yet delivered. That we can do the comprehensive contract, contact tracing that's required, isolate the sick and protect the most vulnerable among us. Months into this pandemic and our national testing capacity remains woefully short. No matter how quickly we want to rejoin society, open our economy and return to normal, the reality is that folks won't have the consumer confidence, which is the essence of our economy. They will not return until a New Jerseyan knows that their risk of contracting COVID-19 has been dramatically mitigated when they go to a store, a mall, a restaurant, or the public square. That is the only way, no matter how much help from Washington, that is the only way we're ultimately going to succeed. I know the governor has a very aggressive plan for that, at least in our state. That's why I successfully fought for an additional $25 billion set aside for testing in the last stimulus, known as COVID 3.5. The money that New Jersey will get from that should bolster the state's efforts. On Friday, the FDA approved Rucker University's at-home saliva test, which is an enormous breakthrough developed right here in New Jersey. And we were able to secure another $11 million in federal funding to expand testing at our 24 federally qualified health centers. But the federal government needs to do more, a lot more, if we are going to successfully defeat COVID-19 and move our economy forward. Senator Bill Cassidy, my Republican colleague from Louisiana, and I recently unveiled the bipartisan State and Municipal Aid for Recovery and Transition Fund. We call it the smart fund, because, well, it's common sense. And I'm pleased to partner with my friend, Congresswoman uh, Mikey Sherrill, who will be leading the bipartisan effort to get this passed in the House. The smart fund provides states with $500 billion in flexible funding, with priority given to the areas of our country with the greatest need, based on COVID-19 infection rates and lost revenues due to the economic fallout. That's what Governor Murphy and his leadership and the bipartisan members of the National Governors Association have been calling for and what the Smart Fund delivers. Not only that, we fixed the problem with $150 billion in state stabilization funds that Congress authorized in the CARES Act. The Smart Fund will retroactively overturn the U.S. Treasury's erroneously restrictive guidance, giving states like New Jersey maximum flexibility to respond to its most urgent needs. Although I'm pleased that after a lot of tough conversations with Treasury, we should be able to use uh, the first tranche of money, hopefully pretty successful, but this will guarantee it. New Jersey is unfortunately a second only to New York in the number of cases, and our economy has been hit harder and longer than most. 
The smart fund ensures New Jersey gets its fair share of federal funding, period, full stop. These flexible federal dollars can help our state dramatically expand its testing capacity and continue to treat COVID-19 patients. It will help stave off massive layoffs and deep painful cuts to the essential services that make our state the great place to live, work, visit, and shop. If we ever want to get back to normal to see businesses thrive, we also need to ensure that our police officers, firefighters, paramedics have the resources they need. We need to keep our streets safe, our kids in school, the buses and trains running on time, and the essential public workers we need to get through this on the job. There's an ideological fight right now in the Congress about whether or not to help our frontline states and communities, but I'm optimistic. Democrats understand what's at stake, and more Republicans are starting to see the situation in their own states grow more dire, both in the number of COVID cases and the economic impact. This isn't a blue state or red state issue. This is an American issue. When I voted for funding for flooding in the Mississippi, wildfires in the West, Hurricane Katrina, I never asked whether it was a red or blue state. That's why we call the country the United States of America. And so as I continue to speak to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, I feel confident more and more we'll see the smart fund as the reasonable, sensible approach it is. We are on the verge of uh, announcing several new Republican Senate colleagues who will join us in this effort, hopefully by the end of this week. And governors, mayors, and county leaders from across New Jersey and coast to coast have expressed support. The New Jersey Policemen's Benevolent Association, the Amalgamated Transit Union, and others have endorsed the smart fund because they understand what's at stake for their members. And I'll continue to press upon my colleagues that the only way to defeat COVID-19 and send our economy on a glide path to recovery is by sending federal reinforcements to the front lines, to the state and local communities waging war with an invisible enemy. The federal government cannot sit on its hands and watch our states go bankrupt and our people suffer. The time to act is now, and I won't give up on this fight. And Governor, I'll just close where I began. After September 11th, we built a national intelligence system and homeland security system that has averted another strike on the homeland. After the 2008 financial collapse, we created new safeguards against systemic risks and gave consumers a champion in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. After Superstorm Sandy, we built New Jersey back, made our beaches more resilient and our communities stronger than the storm. And after COVID-19, we will be better prepared, more resilient in our public health infrastructure. I see a rising sun on New Jersey and the nation, not a setting sun. And together, Governor, we're going to make it shine brighter than the brightest sun we've ever seen. Thank you for your leadership, and thank you for your invitation to be here with you. Senator, thank you for your leadership and partnership and friendship. I literally don't know where I'd be without you. I think of all the important things you just said, the fact that you're going to be able to get some other Republican senators on as sponsors is a big deal. Uh, and it sends a real message, and we're doing everything we can in that regard, but also augmenting uh, the ranks of the Republican governors uh, to join us in the, in the fight. Uh, I mentioned Governor Hogan uh, as the head of the NGA, uh, and his, his persistence here as an example matters. I can't thank you enough, again, for being here. I know you can stay for a little bit longer, but not a whole lot longer. We're going we're gonna to do something further that is uh, uh, out of norm and ask without sweeping across, but very quickly, if anyone has any questions for Senator Menendez um, and uh, specific to, to him, and then I'll go back and do the usual with Judy and Pat and Ed later. Elise and then Nikita and then Dave. Elise, hold on one sec. Martel, hello. Martel's got the mic. Hi. Um, Senator, can you give, give us an indication of how many of your Republican colleagues are willing to support this and um, how many names do you intend to announce by week's end? Uh, we hope to announce by the end of the week. I, I'm, I'm not going to announce for them, but I'll say that we have, uh, in addition to Senator Cassidy, uh, two to three more senators that have just about committed. Uh, they express uh, they will be representative of a significant cross-section of the country. Uh, and one may not be uh, so surprising, but the other one will be. 
And I think what happens, uh, my experience in the Senate and in Congress is, once you begin to uh, create a movement where others feel comfortable in joining, uh, the numbers grow. Uh, you also saw independently, uh, you saw uh, Senator Collins, uh, Senator Mitt Romney, uh, Senator Kennedy from Louisiana, all last week on the Senate floor and in, and in various uh, comments, uh, say that the states need help. Uh, and so uh, I take that to heart. That is a totally different uh, tune than the majority leader has expressed. And when that many members of his own caucus begin to speak up, uh, it makes a big difference. That added with the Governor Murphy's efforts with his Republican governors to speak up both at the White House and to the Congress is, I think, incredibly important. And the last point I'll make, I think we're going to see a lot of momentum come out of the House of Representatives where Speaker Pelosi uh, is firmly committed to a very significant package for the states. I would just make one other comment before we go. We'll go to Nikita and then Dave. Um, we just, as I mentioned, got off a video call. Judy and Pat and I were part of the group that we do at least once a week. And one of the flare-ups, correct me if you've heard this differently, that they are monitoring most carefully right now is in Texas. All right? And so you've got, that's a good example. You've got a Republican governor and two Republican senators. Uh, this virus does not know political boundaries. doesn't know boundaries at all, but it certainly doesn't know political boundaries as an example. Please, Nikita. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, Senator, so I have a quick question, uh, not directly related to what you said, but I know that 18 uh, Republican state attorney generals have called for an investigation into China over what they allege is a cover-up of the spread of coronavirus in that country. Uh, as ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee, do you have a view on that? Well, look, uh, there's no question that uh, this virus began in China, although all the latest evidence suggests that its transmission here in the United States came from European visitors, uh, who ultimately uh, probably uh, caught it by virtue of visits to their countries uh, from those from China. Uh, for me, the problem with China is that they were not forthcoming uh, at the very beginning. And in the potential of a pandemic, you need uh, whatever country is facing that reality to quickly sound the alarms and to fully and openly and transparently give all the information that exists so people can prepare, governments can prepare. I think China failed miserably in that regard. Beyond that, the questions of whether or not uh, there's allegations that this began in a lab versus in an open wet market, I have to be honest with you, uh, from what I've seen, and even now the Secretary of State is backpedaling from those comments, uh, I'm not sure that uh, that is uh, as, uh, as important as uh, dealing with what we're talking about here. How do we deal with this challenge now? How do we get almost universal testing? You know, I'd like to, I haven't been tested, and I'm a asymptomatic. At some point I'd like to get tested because I'd like to go hug my grandchildren, including the new one uh, that was just born, that I have not even met, except through pictures. And that's true, I think it's true for a lot of people. So at the end of the day, you can only do that through the, some form of universal testing, and you need the resources to do that, and then the contact tracing that goes along with that. So I think that the, the sooner we get to that, the more important it is for us opening our economy and getting our lives back. Amen. We'll do one more from Dave, and then if it's okay with you, Senator, we'll go back. Absolutely. Dave's, Dave's over here, Martel. That's John, by the way. John, introduce yourself, please. And Hi, thanks. <laughs> Uh, Senator, um, Governor Murphy has made it a point of creating a relationship with President Trump, it seems, and really tried to let him know um, in any way that he could where he supports him. Uh, do you feel this is an important component of trying to move your efforts forward? Have you reached out to the president? What would your message to the president be? Is there, a, is there space for you to do something with him in a common effort kind of a situation? Well, listen, I applaud, the, uh, I applaud the governor for putting New Jersey's interests first. He doesn't see this as a partisan issue. It should not be. And I appreciate the efforts he's made with the White House and with the president to attract resources for New Jersey, and he's done that successfully. Uh, and that's the way it should be. Um, that's why I'm not making this a partisan piece of legislation. I've particularly withheld its introduction in order to get several other Republicans lined up. And I think that bipartisan approach, which we will see in the Senate and we, which we will see in the House, sends a strong message to the President and the administration that this is not a partisan view, 
And this is not about bailing out the blue states. So this is not red or blue. This is red, white, and blue. And I think that uh, our arguments will be made stronger uh, by Republican governors and senators who are going to be seeing these realities. As I said to them last week when we returned to the Senate and got to engage some of them, I said, look, what you saw happening to us is coming your way. You have the opportunity of time and the benefit of what we've done to uh, advantage yourself and your citizens. Uh, but we're all in this together. And then the last point I'd make as it relates to the president, uh, I think the president, who is uh, obviously very focused on the question of the economy, we generate 20 percent of GDP for the entire nation. Uh, you want to see the economy thrive? You've got to make sure this region thrives, and you want to make sure that states in general thrive uh, in order to create the employment of the tax revenues and the consumer confidence that's necessary. I think, so I think we have uh, common ground in that regard uh, with the president to seek uh, the type of solutions we want. Amen. Amen. This is not politics, but uh, th this would go for anybody on either side of the aisle. I don't know how, if you're on the ballot this November, you want to see uh, police, fire, educators, EMS, health care workers without a job doubling the unemployment rate. I don't get that. I literally don't get that. But Senator, it's an honor to have you here. You're welcome. I know you've got to go at some point, but you're welcome to you and your fiance. It's a blessing to have you both with us. Uh, we're going to get back to some other stuff and uh, come and go as you please and give them hell in Washington. If, if I leave in the midst of it, it's not because I didn't like something you said. Okay, that's okay. a deal. That's a deal. So thank you again for everything. Uh, let's turn, if we could, our attention to the overnight numbers. Yesterday, we received an additional 1,453 positive test results for a current statewide total of 139,945. The number of new cases has showed continual moderation, as you can see, and, and we're seeing real progress in declining positivity rates, as we see in this graph, uh, the daily positivity or the spot positivity rate of samples the day they're collected. And today, the, 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 uh, that rate, I need to get my eyesight better. I believe these were collected on May 7th is the most recent data. Uh, the positivity rate statewide is 26 percent. Uh, and as we've noted, Judy and, and Ed and Christina and I have noted, this number's a bit more insightful than the daily number of cases we announce as it looks at a date certain instead of reporting results batched from several days of samples. And here are the daily positivity rates across each region of the state, and it's obviously converging. The map that we've been regularly turning to keeps showing slower rates of spread across the state. Please, God, that continues. In our hospitals, the number of patients currently being treated for COVID-19 dropped by roughly 430 from where it was, Judy, on Saturday when we last met and now stands at 4,195. As we see, uh, the number of hospitalizations across our health care systems regionally continues to also trend down. And the per capita rate of hospitalizations regionally continues on downward trajectories as well. That was something that we were very focused on, particularly when we saw new hospitalizations spiking in the south uh, with a smaller population. Our field medical stations reported 30 patients. Looking at our long-term care facilities, the numbers of positive cases, as you can see there, 26,397, and the fatalities, which is 4,890, connected to these facilities, continues to grow. We continue to work hard to mitigate these numbers, and we had good reports from this past weekend when the first group of New Jersey National Guard members joined the on-ground staffs in several facilities. This is an all-hands on deck moment, and it has been. The number of patients reported in either critical or intensive care fell again yesterday to 1,255, and ventilator use continues its downward trend with 970 currently in use, and that's the second straight day of the ventilator count being under 1,000. There were 179 new COVID-19 hospitalizations yesterday and 389 across the weekend, but there were 227 live patients discharged yesterday and 666 across both Saturday and Sunday. And here are the numbers from yesterday. Again, this is the only yesterday broken down by region. Again, new hospitalizations on the left, new discharges of live patients on the right. 
Over the past week, I've been adamant about two things. Public health creates economic health, and data determines dates. Tomorrow, we will discuss, as the Senator mentioned, two key metrics to our reopening strategy, the continued ramping up of our testing capacity, and secondly, implementing a robust statewide program of contact tracing. Implementing this plan will be very costly. Throughout this past weekend, we furthered conversations with our federal partners, including with the highest levels of the administration and White House staff. I'm hopeful that our continued efforts and the relationships we have fostered will deliver a significant sum for the state. We are in this position because of the work you are all doing to protect yourselves, your families, and your communities by maintaining the practices of social distancing that are now part of our routine. We are getting data that is making us more comfortable and con confident that we will soon have some hard dates as to when we can truly begin our road back through restart and recovery. But as I am able to give some hard dates, remember that you all did this out there through your hard work over the past nearly two months. Please keep it up, folks. It is clearly working. And as it relates to some hard dates, I hope we'll have some news to report at some point later this week. However, as we are on that road back, sadly, we know that there are those who will not join us for that road back. And today we report another 59 blessed souls who have, who have lost from COVID-19 complications and our statewide total now stands at 9,310. Before we go on, Judy would want me to say, and I will say it, and I suspect she may amplify it, that the Monday data has historically been light. You can literally look at that chart, the bar chart, and go back each Monday. Our reporting uh, is a little bit lagged with the reality. So I love to think that that was a money good. Those, sadly, those folks are gone. We know that. Uh, but my gut tells me, I suspect Judy would agree, that we have to, as we do early week, uh, average a few of the early days of the week together to get a real accurate uh, number. Let's remember several of those blessed souls that we have lost. We begin with Mary Jean McLaughlin of Short Hills. Mary Jean was 89 years old. She was born in Newark and raised in Orange and West Orange before moving with her husband John to Short Hills to raise her family. She graduated from the College of St. Elizabeth and got her teaching certificate in 1956 from Newark State Teachers College what is today Keene University, and began her career at the Lincoln Avenue School in Orange. She put teaching on hold to raise her children, but returned to the classroom in 1979 and began nearly a 30-year stint. And she became a legend, literally, at the Pingree School, where she would eventually lead the language arts department and was an active supporter on the campus-wide Veterans Day and Earth Day programs. Although Mary Jean retired in 2007, she could not find it in her to actually leave the classroom and continue to sub substitute teach for several more years. Bless her, she passed. I guess it's somewhat fitting if she had to go. Bless her heart, she passed on Nat National Teacher Day. Mary Jean leaves her children, John, Michael, Mark, and Edie. I had the great honor of speaking separately yesterday with both John and Edie, and they told stories about their mom, and she was an institution, including in their own household. And she's now reunited with her husband, John. May God bless her soul, and may God bless her family. Next up, this is Felicissimo Omania Luna, Jr. He lived in Woodridge, Bergen County and was known to many as Tom, which was a relief to me because I'm not sure how many times in a row I could have pulled off Felicissimo. Born and raised in the Philippines, he came to the United States in 1986 and worked hard to become a licensed medical technologist for the Hebrew home for the aged in the Riverside neighborhood of the Bronx. It was there that he met a nurse, Enriqueta, known as Kitty, and they would marry, move to Belleville, and raised three daughters, Gabrielle, Graciel, and Giselle. But with a family to help support, Tom kept studying and earned an associate's degree in nursing from Bergen Community College 
and received his RN license. In 2016, he earned his bachelor's degree in nursing from the College of St. Elizabeth. Tom was one of our frontline heroes, a nurse in the emergency department at Trinitas Regional Medical Center in Elizabeth, where he kept up helping those who needed him until he fell ill. And when he did, one of the nurses who attended to him was his daughter, Gabrielle, who followed her parents into the profession. Tom was just 62 years old. Tom, we take our hat off to you for your years of service to the people in your care. May your memory bring peace to Kitty and your daughters. God bless you, pal. And finally today, we remember Marvin Demby of Pensauk. And look at Marvin's smile, man. What a talk about a million dollar smile. His was the face that you would see at the store and keep our nursing homes clean and safe. He was an incredibly hard worker. And Marvin was only 52 years old. He was a proud member of United Food and Commercial Workers Local 360, a clerk with the Price Right, Price right Grocery Store in Camden, as well as a member of the maintenance staff with a Vista Care nursing home in Cherry Hill. He was survived by a daughter, Shanetta, with whom I had the honor of speaking yesterday, and a son, Marvin, and his sisters. Shanetta and Marvin are in Ohio, uh, so they're not in New Jersey, and they desperately, as you can imagine, wanted to come back. Uh, so I know they're far away, but they're close in our hearts and in our prayers. We send our deepest condolences. God bless Marvin's memory and to his family. Three more cherished members of our New Jersey family taken by COVID-19. We remember them as we remember all we have lost. And we also keep their families and friends in our thoughts and prayers. Again, these are the reasons why we must be careful and responsible in our restart and recovery. If we start on the road back too quickly, we know we'll have to remember many more than we need to. And we've already lost 9,310 precious lives. So keep at it, folks. You've been extraordinary. No state has done better than New Jersey in flattening this curve, in, in lowering the amount of hospitalizations. And thank God, even though we've lost so many fatalities, the data is promising. As I, as I said earlier, I'm hopeful to put some dates on the schedule very soon, but we need to keep it up and together we can make all of this work. Switching gears, a couple of quick items. I think I may have said this on Saturday. Judy and I and our colleagues had a good call with legislators on Saturday morning. I thought that was a good back and forth. Likewise, Senator Menendez was on. We had a good call with our, our, our federal congressional delegation. Pat was on both of those calls um, with us. I spoke to leaders of four big food-related entities uh, over the weekend just to get a sense of food security, uh, food supply, et cetera. So leadership at Mondelez, Acme, Wakefern, Stop and Shop. Those were good conversations, uh, sort of walking through both the history, uh, recent history, in terms of the surges and the panics, as well as where we have some food challenges. I also this morning, unrelated to all the above, had an incredible honor took a phone call from the president of the state of Israel, Reuven Rivlin, and uh, the president uh, restated the strong relationship between the state of Israel and New Jersey, that they're there for us in our hour of need, and we both agreed when the dust settles on this awful crisis that a meeting in Jerusalem was something that we each wanted. A quick announcement, the federal government has extended what is known as Title 32, which means that our National Guardsmen and Nar National Guards women will continue to receive pay through the federal government through late June. Uh, Senator Menendez, thank you for your leadership on that as well as so much else. Our guards, men and guards, women have been an integral part of our response team. And as I mentioned earlier, Sarah, some are currently helping in our long-term care facilities, providing much needed backup for the hardworking staff members who have been doing all they can to protect their residents and themselves. Other members of the National Guard have been providing assistance at there are two federally partnered testing sites at Bergen Community College and the PNC Bank Arts Center, helping with traffic flow and directing the residents who arrive to receive a test. So to every member of the New Jersey National Guard who has been part of our team, thank you. And I thank the federal administration for allowing us to keep you on and keep you paid. I mentioned I spoke with the vice president privately on Saturday. We spoke about money, but we also spoke about Title 32. I also um, had a good confirming conversation with the administrator of FEMA, uh, a guy we all now know very well, Pete uh, Gaynor. 
And finally, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to the folks at St. Vincent de Paul's Food Pantry in Long Branch. They're pictured here. I want to thank my friend Mike Beeson for raising this with me. Ever since this emergency began, they've been working overtime to help feed more than 200 families on a regular basis. And this is the spirit that we see all throughout our communities of faith. And to everyone pictured here and the many more who are volunteering and donating, New Jersey thanks you. Keep those coming in. Those stories have been really uplifting for all of us, including yours truly. Again, hashtag NJ thanks you. With that, uh, I know you've got to go in a minute, Senator. God bless you. Safe travels to Washington. Good luck down there. Honored to have you both with us. Uh, I also want to give a shout out, again, uh, Chief Counsel Matt Placken is with us, and the Head of Intergovernmental Affairs, Mike Delamater, is hiding in the corner. I wanted to give him a shout out. With that, I want to turn things over to the woman who needs no introduction. Please help me welcome the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. Well, this is National Hospital Week a time to recognize the life-saving work of New Jersey's hospitals, health systems, and healthcare workers who've done an extraordinary job during this unprecedented COVID-19 epidemic. I know many of you have been thanking them every day. You just didn't wait for this week. Our hospitals employ 154,000 staff, both on the front lines and behind the scenes, with key support services such as meal service, security, housekeeping, and other services. They are our neighbors, our friends, and our family members. And throughout this crisis, they have demonstrated a great personal risk, unwavering dedication, and resiliency. They have and continue to work alongside the Department of Health to expand hospital capacity by doing things like renovating their cafeterias to put in hospital beds and converting their unused space and even their parking lots to increase the number of beds for critically ill patients. They've shown great compassion and empathy by bridging the gap between patients and their loved ones who have been unable to visit them. At the same time, they have continued essential services like welcoming new babies into the world, caring for trauma patients, and keeping their emergency departments open. We recognize that COVID-19 has placed extreme financial pressures on our hospitals and health systems. And we are working with the hospitals to develop practices to open their doors even wider. During this pandemic, the hospitals have continued to treat all of the patients that have come to them for care. In fact, during the past two months, the hospitals have taken care of 346,756 patients who, who are not diagnosed with COVID-19. This week's celebration of National Hospital Week is taking the form of a week of thanks. So let's continue to show our thanks to all the frontline medical and hospital workers by supporting them in any way you can, whether it's donating toward a local restaurant, providing meals, or sending homemade masks, or participating in drive-by thank yous. As for my daily report, as the governor has shared, our hospitals reported 4,195 hospitalizations of COVID-19 patients and persons under investigation. There are approximately 1,255 individuals in critical care and 77% of them on ventilators. The governor reviewed the new cases and deaths. In terms of deaths, the breakdown of deaths by race and ethnicity are basically unchanged. White, 52.8, black, 19.1, Hispanic, 17.5, Asian, 5.3, and other, 5.3. There are 515 long-term care facilities in the state right now with COVID-19 cases. There are over 26,000 COVID-19 cases in these facilities. At the state veterans' homes, among a census of 672 residents, there have been 362 residents that have tested positive and a total of 129 deaths. At our state psychiatric hospitals, with a census of 1,240, 190 patients have tested positive and a total of 12 deaths have been reported. 
The daily percent positivity rate in New Jersey as of May 7th, as the governor shared, is 26%. That concludes my daily report. Stay connected, stay safe, and stay healthy. Thank you. Judy, thank you, and amen on the hospitals and the amount of volume that they see that we don't even talk about uh, hardly at all. Uh, again, I want to make sure I said this right. The May 7 date on positivity is very simply, that's the last date that we have where specimens were collected and we've got complete uh, information on that. So that's why it may sound a little bit uh, in, in Congress given today is May 11. That's a pretty, that's a much faster turnaround than we were looking at a month or two ago. Thank you, Judy, for everything. Uh, with that, Pat Callahan, please take us through any compliance. We had a, another weekend. Uh, would love to get your sense of how things looked in the parks, um, and any PPE infrastructure or other updates. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, with regard to the weekend compliance, uh, Newark Police Department issued 32 EO violations, and they also uh, issued 155 warnings. Um, I'd also uh, be remiss if I didn't note that I spoke to Director Ambrose yesterday afternoon. They lost a 27-year veteran, uh, Sergeant Michael Clegg, uh, a fixture in the Newark Police Department, so our condolences go out to Newark uh, Police Department, the city of Newark, and certainly Michael Clegg's family. Uh, Burlington City Police responded to a, a fight in progress and ended up citing four uh, subjects for violation of the EO. Uh, in Englewood, police responded uh, to the, a violation of a temporary restraining order uh, and subsequently charged uh, that subject. That subject had also been charged twice previously for threatening to spit on officers, also in response to violations of that temporary restraining order. The Patterson police issued an EO violation for a jewelry store being open and, and it's non-essential. Andover Burrow arrested a, an intoxicated uh, driver for DWI, and that subject resisted arrest and threw a facial covering containing blood at the police officers. Uh, with regards to the parks, Governor, I'm, um, although I think the weather Saturday helped tamp some things down, I'm sorry to report that the parks being open, our state park police reported uh, an inordinate amount of urine and feces being left behind in the parks in, in water bottles. Uh, there is a zero tolerance policy for that. The whole idea behind the parks is to give our citizens the ability to go out there and enjoy fresh air and have time outside. Um, and that, that report from the park police was certainly disheartening to say the least. And I just, our park police, our counties, our state police will be on watching for that. Uh, we understand that the restrooms and public restrooms are closed, but uh, people should plan according, accordingly and should not uh, be urinating in bottles and leaving them behind because I think that may lead us to take a different approach moving forward if I, uh, if I could speak for the governor in that regard. So uh, really ask that, uh, that that type of behavior not, not go on. Um, and I'm not sure if you're going to have questions with regards to the, uh, the letter that I put out Saturday, but I'll wait with regards to graduations and wave parades. Uh, with that, Governor, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, this last point, I make two, two comments about parks. Uh, <clears throat> this last point, uh, I, I like your phrase, zero tolerance, that you're not going to get a warning if we catch you leaving uh, something like that behind. So, folks, please don't do that. Secondly, I had a very good conversation with Catherine McCabe, our Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. She, I think, also spoke with Judy and, and the team, Pat, as well. Um, we'd love to see a lot more masking and face covering. Uh, and so I think what we're going to do, uh, we talked earlier today uh, in the margins, uh, DOH has got some really good signage um, about masking. I think you'll probably see, I can't tell you when, but. Uh, Pat's going to make sure that he coordinates it with Catherine, and you're going to see a lot more visible imploring of folks to wear face coverings. And Catherine makes the point uh, is that you get a lot of a lot of parks with where the trails are very narrow, um, and you, you can't social distance. You just physically can't without going off the edge or going into the thicket of the woods. It just is impossible, and so the more face coverings we can get, the better. I think that's a general matter, folks. The more we can cover our faces, the better off we'll be. Uh, and I think increasingly by the day, if not by the minute, 
there's less stigma associated with it. Just, it's just what we're doing these days. It is what it is. Um, uh, and so uh, let, let, I think you should see, my guess is you'll see more of that imploring uh, in places. We'll start over here with Elise Martel. Before we uh, jump in, though, um, and again, great to have you with us, as you are every day. Um, tomorrow, Dan will be at 1 o'clock. And tomorrow, we've already said this, but tomorrow will be a heavy dose of, a dose of both what testing is going to look like in the state and contact tracing. And so we'll leave that till tomorrow if we can. Uh, and a lot of really good work has been put into that. And I personally, and I think I'm joined by my colleagues, are, are quite proud of where we're coming out on that. And again, remember, folks, we want to give you the confidence that it's OK once we say you could do X, that you feel confident about doing X with your family. Um, and we need to make sure a big part of that is that the curves have got to keep coming down. They are. Uh, let's keep it that way. Um, that we've got to have that testing and tracing protocol infrastructure in place that you all can look at and say, you know, I believe that. I got it. That's, the, 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 there's, there's an architecture in place that gives me uh, confidence. And I mentioned I'm not going to marry myself to a day, but I would hope by the end of the week we could give, a, assuming the curves keep going in the right direction, that's a big assumption, that we could give a little bit more uh, guidance as to some other things that we're looking at, again, on that road back to recovery. But don't hold us to a day uh, on that. But tomorrow, we please do, unless there's an emergency, please, God, uh, 1 o'clock tomorrow, testing and contact tracing will be the big topics of the day. So with that, Elise, good afternoon. Can we keep these relatively moving along, folks, if we could? Good afternoon. Can you give us any details of the White House call today? Uh, particularly, did the White House promise uh, broadened testing for New Jersey and New York or elsewhere? And my second question is, have any of the summonsed uh, businesses or individuals started to work their way through the courts yet, or will that happen when the state reopens? Thank you. Thank you for both, Elise. On the first one, uh, it was, um, I, I'll tell you what struck me the most. Um, on the White House end, I think this is a good thing, there was a lot of social distancing and masks, uh, including they had a double barrel camera, uh, and you had Vice President Pence in one room and Do Dr. Burks in another room. Uh, and you may have read that a lot of, the, a lot of their senior medical uh, uh, experts are self-quarantining. So there was really, I didn't see, other than staff, I didn't see anyone else on that call unless you all did, other than the Vice President, Dr. Burks. Well, I'll, I'll defer the testing until tomorrow, but they have been integrally involved uh, and very helpful. So we'll, we'll give you, if you could bear with us on, uh, on that, we'll give you the full soup to nuts uh, tomorrow. Matt, can you answer the question, is any if folks who've been summoned, have they, uh, any of them made their way through the courts? Pat might have a better uh, idea, or we can get one on public safety to weigh in. I couldn't hear you, Matt. I said, I'm not sure if the colonel has a better idea. I don't know offhand, but we can ask the attorney general's office to Yeah, I wasn't in. sure which uh, courts were open or closed. I don't, I, that was the one point that... Uh... Dan, where are you? Can, can we come back to Elise with an answer on that? Thank you very much. Sir, good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Uh, why are so-called... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why are schools not allowed to hold those so-called wave parades? Uh, Colonel, are you really going to go after principals who don't cancel these parades and what punishment could they face? And Governor, how can you justify allowing people to play golf when seniors are banned from these drive-by graduations when both are outdoors? When seniors, you mean high school seniors or senior citizens? High school seniors. Okay. I'll let the colonel, he alluded to this letter, I'll let him take that one. Thank you. I had you. a feeling it was coming. Yeah, that, we were receiving several questions with regards to graduations and different proposals being put out there. So first off, we, we would never and we could not prevent vehicles driving by. Let's say it's a senior and he, him or her are on their front porch with their parents. Those vehicles can, can go by. What we are discouraging and the intent of my letter to Department of Education and public and non-public schools was directing students to gather on the front lawn of a school, at a football stadium, at a town hall, because what you're doing is inviting them to gather, which is in violation of the EO. So I think there was confusion um, that people who are out of their uh, 
cars, that was the issue, the wave parades, and we've seen it with fire departments and police. I think the governor commented on it two weeks ago. It's a great gesture to give that sense of solidarity, but when there's 50 people standing on top of each other on the curb of a hospital or in front of a high school, that's where the problem comes in. So if people wanted to get in cars and drive to every graduate at a high school across town and those that graduate and mom and dad were on the front porch or front lawn, that is certainly okay, but it's the summoning of people to gather together for a graduation or that wave parade that I hope I was clear in the letter, uh, received a lot of feedback on it, so I hope that, that what I just gave clarifies, uh, clarifies what our intent is there. If you look at, by the way, what we're, the parameters we put around golf, it's the, fur it's the furthest thing from what you're hearing about at, at congregating in a football stadium. Literally, you've got a golf basically I think you, you, you've got to go, you've got to drive your own cart and you can at most have a twosome unless you're a blood relative uh, family that congregates together. Okay, real, real quick, please. Colonel, the, the letter I saw said that wave parades should be canceled. Are you saying that they don't have to be canceled if people are not gathering at a, at a school or a central location? I think I'm, I'm clarifying it here now. A wave parade that does not summon students or individuals to one location. So if that's seven cars want to drive by a senior's house and that family is on the front porch or in the yard, that is certainly not in violation of the EO. But what I was hearing was that they were all going to be assembled at a school, at a town hall, at a football field, which would be in violation. And not in their cars. You're saying that they'd be getting right, out of their cars. Right, they'd be getting out of their cars to happen. wave at people, and that's where we've seen uh, no mask and people within closer than six feet of each other. So where hearts, we're, we're good. Where hearts, we'll go back to Matt, where hearts are breaking here, most importantly for the fatalities. But on that list of broken hearts are seniors and their families. It stinks. There's no other way to put it. Uh, and we feel awful, but we also got to make sure we don't, by celebrating this year, that we lose somebody. And we can't do that, particularly in the intergenerational spread of this virus. Matt, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, the target date to begin testing for all inmates and prison staff was last week. I'm curious if you could give an update on how many tests have been done uh, and what the anticipated timeline is for testing everyone in the state's prison system. And real quick, Governor, just curious if you could explain why you pulled both NJ Transit board nominees late last week. Um, curious of how that sort of hampers some of your uh, uh, things that you wanted to get, get done with NJ Transit, how that might slow things down. I don't have an answer on how much have been tested. Do you happen to know, Judy? But we can get back to you on that. And you're going to hear vulnerable populations. I don't want to preview too much for tomorrow, but vulnerable populations are at the top of the list. Uh, in terms of priorities on testing. Matt, would you want to add to something? Just, just one clarification. I don't think we said everyone would be tested by last week. They were beginning to staff or, or to phase in the using the Rutgers test, universal testing starting last week. Is that correct, Commissioner? Yeah. We'll get, can we get back to you with any, any color on that? You're going to hear the broader answer to your question tomorrow in terms of how we anticipate going about the broad community. Uh, can we get back to Matt on, on how much has already been done, if that's all right? No, no insights on NJ Transit. I mean, that, this stuff happens all the time. We put people up, we pull back. Uh, n no, uh, no uh, juicy backstory. And, and I, I don't anti listen. We want a full board. We want everybody in the seat. We want it properly representative for the particular categories, in particular that that are um, whether they're advocates or bus riders or train riders. That's all very important, but we're not going to hold up progress of NJ Transit as a result. I would hope we can get back and get some folks nominated sooner than later. You good, sir? Okay. You're good. We're com coming at you here. Hold on, Ian. Thank you, Governor. Uh, what do you think of the cooperative plasma donation agreement between University Hospital and the Red Cross? And can you update us on the number of children hospitalized by COVID-related symptoms in the state? How many pediatric deaths? And what can you tell us about the four-year-old who died? You said it wasn't related to Kawasaki-related illness. Was it heart failure related to COVID, as we know many of these children have experienced? Is the decrease in cases due to social distancing, or is there any evidence that this could be the virus waning due to the warmer weather, as some had predicted? Uh, what proportion of new cases are coming from the general public versus from uh, institutional settings? Do we know that percentage? And well, one more, sir. Okay. Um, and what can we expect an update on the work being done in Salem County for the testing of migrant workers? Testing of what, sorry? Mi migrant workers on the farms. 
Okay, so Judy, I'm going to take shots of these and you come in behind, okay? Is that all right? Sound, sound good? We'll partner. Uh, University Hospital, Red Cross, we were here Saturday and we love it. So it's, it's, it holds a lot of promise. Matt was singled out as someone who's gone through it and, and donated having uh, been a positive. Uh, it holds enormous promise, how much promise to be determined. Uh, but we were thrilled to have Rosie and Sharif both with us on Saturday. I think it looks great. Um, I don't, Judy will come back to you. I, I don't know that we know how many kids are in hospitals, but I'll let her come back to you. Nothing more on the four-year-old other than if we felt it, it edged anywhere close to a public health concern, I promise you we would be more forthcoming. Uh, it does not, and out of respect for privacy for the blessed little soul and families, we're going to keep it that way. Numbers are coming down. Ed should chime in here. I don't think there's any, and, and I'll say a couple more things and then turn it to Judy and Ed. I don't think people know right now whether warmer, there's a huge raging debate around the world whether warmer, warmer weather will or will not impact this. Um, H1N1, it did, uh, but there's evidence that suggests the other side of it. I'll let, I'll let uh, Ed jump in. There's no question social distancing, though. The fact of the matter is the weather hasn't been that warm. Uh, it's warmer than it was a month or two ago, but it really isn't that warm. Uh, you know, not you know, not 90 degree full bore, um, you know, Jersey summer high humidity weather. So, I don't think that's uh, personally uh, Ed's the boss here. I don't think that's a contributing factor right now. I think it's the fact that people are staying away from each other. I, I, Martel, come back because I missed your 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 institutional settings. What was the question? Knowing the proportion of new cases from the general public and institutional settings, and if that most cases are in an institutional setting and not the public, could that help inform our decision yeah. on opening up the state? Sorry, I got it. So we know cumulatively. I'm not sure we know the spot number. We, we show the chart. If someone could pull up how many are in long-term care facilities, that doesn't include, obviously, uh, necessarily prison community, et cetera. Uh, but it, 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 it is around, I think historically, it's been around 15 to 20 percent of the total number of positive cases. It's sadly a much higher number of fatalities, as you've seen. It's about, that's the total, this is long-term care only. That's a proxy uh, for the broader institutional community. I assume you include prisons, et cetera, in that. Uh, and our total case, our total positives are 140,000 basically now. Um, and so you'd add somewhat to that. I just don't know when that we've got the spot rate. On migrant workers, that's part of, uh, Judy's going to speak to that explicitly tomorrow. Th that is in a high priority setting in terms of the testing protocol that we'll be talking about tomorrow. Judy, you or Ed adding anything to any of that? Uh, Governor, as usual, has done an excellent job as far as going through those things. No, we don't know whether the hot weather is going to make a difference or not. Certainly, we can hope it does. Unfortunately, when we look at some of the other countries around the world, which have been in summer while we've been in winter, we haven't seen that happen. So as to whether whether it's paying in, any impact here in New Jersey, guess is probably not. Without a doubt, I will say that the social distancing measures have made a difference. They have saved lives. Uh, that much is clear. I have no doubt in my mind that our numbers would be worse and our deaths would be higher if these measures hadn't been undertaken. Uh, so that's as far as that goes. And as far as kids in hospitals and things, I don't have a spot number, meaning I can't tell you exactly how many children are in right now. I can tell you that overall, kids under the uh, age of 18 are about 2% of the total hospitalizations that we've had. Or in other words, out of the 50,360 hospitalizations that we know about, there were 884 who were children. Um, thank you. I'm going to do that at the end, Pat, if that's all right with you. That's a good one. We'll come, come down to Dave if we could. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Hi, Governor. Uh, last, uh, the last several days when you announced that school was going to be canceled for the rest of the year, uh, you and the Education Commissioner talked a lot about looking at creative alternatives about graduation. Um, as the Colonel referenced, there was one letter from him uh, another email from somebody in the education department talking about that now we're only going to have the virtual graduations. Some educators and parents we have heard are upset by what they say is an apparent change in the message here. Has it changed, do you think? Why only virtual and nothing else? Um, you know, six feet apart on a football field with everybody wearing masks, they're outside. Is there a concern that 
in setting that up, there may be more um, contact with people next to each other? Are you afraid that other situations like weddings, they might try to make the same argument? What's the thinking about this? Because as, as you've referenced so many times, you know, this is such a milestone in, in the history of high school graduation, not only for the kids, but the parents as well. Thank you. Um, I'll give you my thoughts, and Pat, you may want to come in. Um, we haven't changed our, our tune. Um, and including, this came up on the call with the congressional delegation this morning. One of the things we have alluded to, and I would repeat today, if graduation was supposed to be on June 1st, as we look at June 1st right now, one guy's opinion, we'll be more open than we are today. And I think there'll be a couple of steps, as I said, that I hope that we can we could touch later this week and give some specificity. Um, but I don't know that we'll be, quote unquote, completely out of the woods that we could do what you're suggesting. Could we do it on August 1st? I'd, I'd, put, I'd put more money on that. I wouldn't make it still non-refundable. Uh, but so I ne we never married ourselves to timing. We always thought there was going to be some virtualness around this. Uh, and that's if it's in the here and now. And again, if Judy sees this differently, we're going to take some some steps. But I, I just don't think we're there yet. Um, uh, and and um, could we get there? Yes, I think we could get there. But I can't. I can't promise that, and, and again, this is all dependent on a series of very specific health steps and markers that we've laid out that are crystal clear, that these curves have to keep coming down, that we get the testing and contact tracing that Judy and others are going to speak about tomorrow. Um, and again, we're, we're making progress. Again, if your graduation is June 1st, I can't real, you know, honestly tell you uh, that you're going to get there by then. But could we get there down the road? The answer is yes. I, I, as I said, there's nothing like losing somebody. So let's just put fatalities, serious illness to, to a, a respectful aside for a moment because that's the, that's the loss that you can never get back. This is the, among the most heartbreaking ones that we, that we hear about. For, and parents are not bashful. I've heard from seniors themselves. You heard Lamont Repolette sitting here as the commissioner of the Department of Education a few days ago with a high school senior, and his daughter's not going to get that. You know, that's a, so it, it stinks. There's no other way to put it. But I'm not, never say never, um, but if, for at the moment, uh, we can't congregate. We cannot do that. Um, it is still a stay-at-home, overwhelmingly stay-at-home state. I hope we're going to be able to, again, the curves keep going. We'll be able to tweak, I hope, uh, step by step, and we would that we would be the happiest people, uh, other than parents of high school seniors and the high school seniors themselves. I promise you. Thank you, Dave. Nikita, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. I still uh, have not spoken with the Vice President. By, uh, that was, I was actually going to ask that. It's really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> with that, without that kidding, one. it's helpful that you say that from the outset. Um, but I did want to, I guess, sort of refresh some other questions. Uh, so is there any chance that we'll hear an update about the July primaries sometime this week? And then uh, have you given any further thought to the possibility of a second budget address? Both good questions. Uh, on the latter, I haven't, but that's something that we're considering. So, uh, and I give you the assist for uh, raising a level of consciousness associated with it. Um, I think in the here and now, and Matt can correct me if I'm wrong here, we want to see how tomorrow goes. Uh, we've got a pretty good experiment before us. Clearly, it's not statewide. It's got different dimensions. Uh, these are local races, and but every race is important. And I think we want to see what tomorrow looks like. So does that mean this week or not? I don't know, but I do know that we're the, the clock is running, and it's going to need to be sooner than later. So let's see how tomorrow goes. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. Thank you for that. John, you're going to bring us out today. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I have two questions on testing uh, the numbers that we're getting. Um, I'm trying to understand the positivity rate. Uh, if, forgive me. On April 1st, the difference between positive cases from major labs and the positive total reported by the state was about 1,700. Uh, that number has grown to last week where there was a difference, an average daily difference of 30,000 between the total number you're reporting and the total number of positives from major labs. Can you explain the difference and why that grew? Um, and yesterday there was a report of total tests from 
again from labs, which was 280,000. But now the dashboard doesn't have these major lab tests, uh, and it says the total test reported was 425,000. Can you explain that huge jump and what, what does this new number mean? Uh, and also, again, on the, the pediatric inflammatory syndrome, can we get a total number of cases? Uh, is the state tracking that? And, Governor, over the weekend with a lot of people on the, you know, down the shore on the boardwalk and whatnot, um, there were some, at least one legislator and others trying to promote protests against this. Uh, one Republican legislator was urging people to go outside and, quote, take this rebellion a few steps further, get ready. Any reaction to that? Was that Senator O'Scallon? Yes, it was. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll close with that. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a particular view on that. Um, do you want to take the testing, you folks, the numbers, as well as the pediatric um, infl inflammatory? Thank you. When it comes to tests, traditionally we're a whole lot more confident when we get a positive than when we either don't hear anything or we get a negative. And the reason for that is because labs are used to reporting to us positive results. That's what's required under our regulations. They're much less used to reporting negatives. So when we began with COVID and we sent out the request to labs, hey, we want the positives and the negatives, we were more comfortable with what we called the major labs. We worked with them more regularly. We were getting most of the data from them back and forth. They had a good electronic connection that we knew going back and forth so that we were comfortable that we were getting all the results, both positive and negative, from them. As time went on, and that was about 95% of all the results we were getting at the beginning. As time went on and you began to get a lot more laboratories that came in and, and play in this arena and a lot more began doing the testing and sending us results as well, the percentage that we were getting from the major labs dropped over time from about 95% down to about 80%, which is about where we're at now. So now they're still doing a, a lot, but other laboratories have sprung up. Uh, as those labs come in from other laboratories, we begin to see whether we're getting positives and negatives, and literally at this point we get results from over 100 laboratories, again from over 100 laboratories when it comes to this. As you can imagine, it's hard to know for sure whether every one of those labs is sending you every result. And that's why we have tended to stick with those major labs when it came to figuring out our positivity numbers. We knew it wasn't the total population out there, but we were most comfortable that we're getting both the positives and the negatives accurately so that we could make that calculation. Uh, going forward, again, we're seeing more and more that we are getting negatives from more and more of these labs, so we're trying to include that in, in the totals. We've always included out all the positives from all the different labs. Uh, hopefully that answered that. And uh, briefly about the question about the uh, pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome, or sometimes known as Kawasaki or toxic shock related, we're still very early in this process. We put out what's known as a call for cases out to the community last week, and we've begun to hear back about potential cases in New Jersey. We, we've heard of eight so far of uh, children, luckily no deaths at this time. As I said, very early in the investigation, it is not yet clear whether these are all still related or all related to COVID or, or not, but that's where we're at. Thank you, Ed. Um, yeah, listen, I, I consider uh, Senator O'Scallon a, a good guy and a good friend, but I have to remind we both live in Monmouth County. There are just under 7,000 positives as of today in Monmouth County, and 445 people have died from our county. So I want to open the state up as much as the next guy, trust me. A uh, hundred and something people went into the hospital yesterday. Uh, we're still, the, the house is still on fire. Has it gotten better? Yeah, it's clearly gotten better. But let's be responsible, man. Let's, let's be responsible. Let's do this together. I've already, you know, opening up county and state parks and golf was a big step. It was a big step in many respects, including for mental health, and it feels like it, it's paid off. There's been some non-compliant behavior, which we're going to crack down on, but for the most part, people are doing the right things, and Folks deserved it because of the amount of progress we've made. We're looking at taking other steps right now responsibly. We had a really good discussion, the models that Judy and Ed and their team look at, the benefit you get in terms of literally cracking this virus to the ground from an, another two weeks at any point in time of social distancing beyond the point that you otherwise would have stopped social distancing is enormous. The curves are... You, you, your jaw drops and you say, okay, 
from any point to the two weeks later. So listen, I, I think we've all got to be responsible. So far, so good. We've, we've hung in there together uh, across the aisle, across geographies. Um, we got to keep that up. But, you know, again, it's the county I know because I live in it. It's the one I know the best. 445 would have been unfathomable in Monmouth County three months ago to think that 445 people would have died from something like this. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it, this is in all of our neighborhoods, all of our counties, up and down the state. Let's do this responsibly. I want to open up as much as anybody, but let's do it together. Let's do it with responsibility. Let's do it based on the data, uh, and let's do it together. With that, I'm going to mask up, if that's all right. I got my American flag on today and remind everybody I'm still wa I still fly five American flags at my house. I don't know why Pat didn't say this, but I'm going to say this as an homage to Pat and every other law enforcement officer in this state, including the extraordinary members of the state police who protect me and my family. It's National Police Week, and it started today. So not only do we have the National Hospital Week on the one side, we get National Police Week. So to each and every one of the members of law enforcement, we tip our hat to you. We do that in any event, but we really tip our hat to you in, in, in the war that we're fighting. It's extraordinary. In fact, I'm going to be on a virtual town hall with you and the Attorney General kicking it off at 4 o'clock today, which I'm really excited about, and thank you for inviting me. So, folks, again, keep doing what you're doing. You've done an extraordinary job. Keep it up. I promise you there, there's going to there'll be a payoff. I promise you. Uh, tomorrow is going to be a big day of discussion on testing and contact tracing. As I said, if I have my druthers, I hope by the end of this week we'll be able to talk about other date certain steps we can make. Election day in a lot of communities tomorrow, so folks, we're going to look at that as Nikita and Nikita's question triggered uh, in terms of how the vote by mail reality works uh, in those communities in New Jersey. We'll be together at 1 o'clock tomorrow, Dan, is that right? Uh, I want to thank again Judy Persichelli and Ed Lifshitz to my right. Pat Callahan, Jared Maples to my left. To each and every one of you, keep it up. God bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow.